This installment of Washington Legal Foundation's Legally Brief features Tammy McCutcheon, a shareholder with the law firm Littler Mendelssohn and a former head of the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division, who will share her thoughts on the recently argued Supreme Court case, Christopher v. smith Klein Beecham. The court heard argument in this Fair Labor Standards Act case on April 16th. What was the issue before the justices in Christopher? The issue was whether the sales representatives working for this pharmaceutical company and other pharmaceutical companies are entitled to overtime pay under the FLSA. Uh, by the way, these employees on average earn around $90,000 per year, um, and many of them earn more than $100,000 per year. Which particular aspects of the case did the justices focus on during oral argument, and how did they react to the points being made by each side? There were two questions before the court. First was whether the sales representatives qualify as outside sales employees, a classification which is not entitled to overtime pay under the FLSA. The second issue was whether federal courts should defer to positions of the Department of Labor and other agencies taken for the first time in amicus briefs that are filed with the courts. I understand that the pharmaceutical sales representatives visit doctor's offices to persuade them to prescribe their employer's medicines and are paid based on the level of those medicines purchased in their sales area. Why would that not be outside sales? Well, that's right. These employees are um, hired as sales employees, trained as sales employees, and they are paid like sales employees. In other words, they get bonuses, commissions, based on the amount of pharmaceutical sales in their region. Uh, but the plaintiffs in this case, uh, supported by the amicus brief filed by the Labor Department, argue that no actual sale occurs because under other federal laws controlling how prescription medications can be sold, the sales representatives themselves are prohibited from actually transferring title of the property, that is the medications, directly from them to the doctor. Rather, uh, the Labor Department says the sale only occurs when a doctor writes the prescription and the patient goes to the pharmacy and fills that prescription. Um, that's the core of the issue. What does it mean to sell? And do outside sales employees have to actually transfer title to the property for a sale to occur? Um, now, during oral arguments, Justice Scalia stated fairly clearly and strongly that he thought that this argument that's being proposed by the Department of Labor um, ignores the realities of this very particular industry. Um, and even some of the more liberal justices, Breyer, Ginsburg, Kagan, they seemed very troubled by DOL's position, but they were also looking for a rule to apply that would not result in an expansion of the outside sales overtime exemption. Let's talk a minute about the uh, second issue there, deferring to the position DOL took in its amicus brief. Well, I was very surprised by how the oral arguments went on this issue. Um, and this is the issue that will have a much broader impact on any business who is trying to figure out what federal regulations require and comply with them. What happened in this case is that DOL had never informed the pharmaceutical industry that its sales representatives are entitled to overtime pay. Even though this job has existed for 70 years and every company in the industry had treated these sales uh, representatives as exempt from overtime pay requirements for all of those 70 years. Then around 2007, the plaintiff's bar started to sue almost every pharmaceutical company in the country. Um, and at that time, or very shortly thereafter, the pharmaceutical industry asked the Department of Labor to issue what's called an opinion letter telling the industry whether or not they should be paying these sales reps overtime. The DOL refused. The DOL never answered them. Then, however, after the pharmaceutical companies started winning the cases in litigation before the trial court levels, DOL, for some unknown reason, started filing amicus briefs stating that the sales representatives were indeed entitled to overtime pay. Um, the courts, federal courts, started listening to the Department of Labor, and the companies started losing cases. Um, during oral arguments, not a single justice endorsed the DOL's process here. In fact, Justice Breyer was quite critical of DOL's process of failing to make a regulatory, in a, in a sense, a regulatory change uh, through the normal processes rather than through a brief. Now, why should the outcome of this case be of concern to businesses beyond those in the pharmaceutical industry? Also, what sort of larger public interest principle is at stake here? 
Well, there's two things. First, any business with outside sales employees who are not now receiving overtime pay, um, but who don't actually process the final sale transaction, that is, they don't take any action themselves to transfer title of property, like finishing up the contract paperwork or pushing the button um, to um, process the sale on a computer, should be concerned by the Department of Labor's attempt to narrow uh, the overtime exemption because such employees, if the Supreme Court rules in favor of the plaintiffs, um, could be entitled to overtime pay. And beyond that, every business, especially small businesses, will be impacted if the Supreme Court's opinion allows federal agencies to announce such new positions which impose retroactive liability through a court brief rather than through the normal regulatory process. One pharmaceutical company has already paid $99 million in overtime back wages to its sales representatives because of the DOL court brief that was filed uh, in the Second Circuit. These types of regulatory changes should only be allowed through the Administrative Procedures Act, which requires an agency to publish the proposed regulations, gives the public a chance to comment on those regulations, and ensures that the changes apply only going forward, which gives the businesses a chance um, to react and adjust to the new regulatory requirements. What happened here was the Department of Labor through a court brief that almost nobody in, uh, out there has read except for us wage and hour geeks, um, did, applied retroactive liability to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, what happened here to the pharma industry is stealth regulation by the Department of Labor. And it is, if this is allowed, any industry could be the next target by any federal agency. W.I. filed an amicus brief in support of the respondents in Christopher, which is available on our website under the litigation section, www.wlf.org.